Well, welcome to uh, Palipidology. Uh, today, uh, factor number two, uh, which is, of course, the mysteries of the organisms. Uh, organisms are a very important factor in soil formation, as was realized by uh, Dokuchev uh, in 1883 in his monograph on the Russian Chernitsim. Um, he made it very clear that this was not a geological deposit. It was not a simply a weathering profile or a chemical profile. Um, it was a biological construct made from the fecal pellets of earthworms, the burrows of marmots, and the roots of grasses. Now, um, in organisms, uh, we have, of course, a whole discipline called um, paleontology, and particularly uh, the discipline of um, ichnology, or trace fossils. Uh, these are traces of life in the fossil um, record. Um, think um, dinosaur track, um, worm burrow, um, various evidence that uh, something um, was uh, there. There's uh, a, a lot of people study individual trace fossils, and we'll actually talk about trace fossils in paleosols. Um, which are an important evidence of life in a paleosol. But think about um, the paleosol itself. Um, it's really a trace fossil of a ecosystem. We'll talk about that as well. Different soil types reflect different ecosystems. And this was one of the great charms of paleopedology back in the day when I was a blonde headed stompy wompy will go on surfer boy. Um, uh, when the surf was down around the sea cliffs of Sydney, um, looking at these soils and seeing that the soils were telling me what the ecosystem was like, um, a lot more effectively than were the fossil leaves that were preserved in the same um, stratum, uh, often as leaf litters in the same uh, in the same paleosol. Now, ideally, we would really like uh, to have um, a um, a bio sequence and a a bio uh, function. That would be great. Um, the best Hansiani could do in his influential book of 1941 um, was um, the prairie, um, the prairie forest boundary of um, Illinois. Um, and uh, what uh, he noted uh, in that situation is that we have a very interesting situation uh, where we have a mollusol out here, typical grassland soil of tall grass berry, um, as deep as a meter. Uh, uh, this is the tall grass berry now in a fairly humid climate. Uh, and then um, we have an alpha sol here. And the alpha sol BT horizon goes down to here. This is A, BT, this is A, uh, this is C, um, the lucic parent material uh, down um, in here. Uh, you can regard this as a, an ecotone, uh, a boundary between the prairie and the oak hickory forest. Uh, and that is reflected in a very, very different sort of a soil beneath one. Uh, compared to the other. The soil types are um, really uh, good indications of particular um, environments. You could get biofunctions of the amount of organic matter in the profile, of the, the base status of the clays, of the amount of clay. Um, it would be a very limited usefulness in the fossil record, however, because it applies only to this particular um, location. And that's the problem with biosequences and biofunctions. Um, the formations of plants and animals change dramatically as you change climate, uh, so that the soils are zoned in the same way as the vegetation is zoned. Uh, and so it's very difficult uh, to get an all-encompassing biofunction uh, to be able to apply 
to paleosols. This one's quite specific because you're in the same location. This is basically literally it's an abrupt boundary between the forest and the prairie and that's because the prairie was maintained by burning uh, and it's a it's an unnatural boundary in that respect uh, it was maintained by um, Native Americans uh, in, in burning the fields uh, in order to um, flush out game and improve forage uh, for uh, deer and other uh, game uh, and that's created an unnaturally sharp boundary um, although there's a bit of slop in it because the boundary has migrated back and forth with climate changes over the last uh, 10,000 years or so. So mathematical biofunctions are eluding us, you'll be glad to hear. But uh, there's still an amazing amount that we can tell uh, by looking um, at um, individual uh, soil profiles to look at actual trace fossils of uh, particular creatures in soils. Uh, for example, uh, trees. It's quite common to get fossil tree trunks rooted in paleosols. You saw an example from the Yellowstone National Forest, um, National Park, uh, last time. Um, it was a permineralized tree that was actually rooted um, in a, uh, a paleosol, uh, which we had samples of uh, in the lab. Uh, trees uh, can uh, leave big root traces. They can leave stumps. Uh, they can also leave um, a rather interesting structure, and these are found uh, particularly under cowrie trees, long-lived um, conifer trees, um, particularly in uh, New Zealand and Western Australia. Uh, they can also leave a very thickened A horizon. Uh, some trees uh, create a very thick uh, leach horizon uh, because the leaching of the rain through their leaves uh, takes phenols, which are acidic, down into the soil. That has the effect of effectively destroying um, clays. So you get an, an E of a BS, uh, which is basically a spodosol. Uh, and that E horizon is thickened under the tree itself. This is called a basket pudsol. Now the pod soil is, uh, in the original sense of uh, what the soil used to be called in Russia, uh, in the good old days of the Tsars, um, it was a, a kind of a soil uh, which had an under ash, that's what that means, under ash. And it refers to this alluvial horizon, this leached horizon. If that thickens up a lot, uh, sometimes that you can have extensions down. Um, that's telling you there was a tree there, a very long-lived tree, probably lived there for thousands of years, and it created this distinctive um, thickened E horizon. Um, these are best known uh, in uh, under cowrie trees uh, in New Zealand and Western Australia. This is a plant called um, Agathis. Um, there are um, also um, evidences of um, individual uh, kinds of uh, creatures in uh, paleosols. And these are, this is the ethnology of uh, paleosols, as it were. Um, I started doing this work a long time ago, and I'm pleased to say that this is something that has really uh, taken off. The ethnology or the, the trace fossils of paleosols are very interesting, as I hope I can demonstrate. Um, one of these is um, rock varnish, sometimes called desert varnish. It's a feature you see um, in desert communities. Um, there's a stone on the desert soil, like so, uh, and that stone tends to take up a iron manganese, F-E-M-N, crust. It's called burnicide. Burnicide is not a mineral name, it's a mixture of um, iron and manganese um, oxides. Um, we know how it forms. We know it forms from the action of bacteria, of iron and manganese oxidizing bacteria. Uh, here are two of the ones that we know about. Metallogenium is a very interesting star-shaped one. It has these slime threads um, around it. These are sessile um, bacteria and uh, pedomicrobium, which is a simple coccoid uh, little bacteria.
bacteria, uh, which is capable of creating uh, these iron and manganese crusts. Um, if you put this iron and manganese crust under a scanning electron microscope in the modern desert, or even in examples of these which are now known, all the way back to about two billion years in the Precambrian, you can sometimes see these star forms. And also, at very high magnification, you can see um, these black domed structures. They're tiny. We're talking about one millimeter or so. They have these layers to them. These are mini stromatolites. Now, you'll probably know about stromatolites from your other geological courses. Stromatolites can be quite large, um, sometimes meters in size. And they're caused by the successive um, layering of um, carbonate or um, iron oxides uh, by uh, microbes. Uh, it's a trace fossil of a microbe. Uh, the doming occurs because the microbes also produce gases, and the gases uh, tend to produce a swelling underneath of the um, underlying material um, that is uh, a kind of a slime of extracellular polysaccharides, which is uh, abbreviated to EPS. Uh, and that action of the gas on that extra, I'm losing that one, the extracellular polysaccharides uh, is what creates the, uh, the doming. It's kind of a gel of sugar, if you like. Uh, and um, microbes make a number of these extracellular polysaccharides um, in order that they can glide up and down with night and day, uh, so they can move around, uh, and as a defense uh, against other uh, microbes. It's a, it's a microbe, microbe world out there. There's a whole microbiome to soils that we're just beginning uh, to um, be able to appreciate. Earthworms. Earthworms are, of course, very familiar to you if you've ever been uh, fishing. Um, they have um, a structure which is long and has lots of segments to it. Uh, each segment is a complete little organism to itself. You can, they can regenerate um, most of the creature. It has a, a mouth at one end and a gut at the other end. They uh, munch through the soil, um, eating the soil. Uh, for organic matter. They like organic rich soils. They particularly like grassland soils. Uh, and then they poop it out the other end. And so they tend to make a burrow which is quite circular uh, with fecal pellets in it. The fecal pellets are ellipsoidal. The fecal pellets are the indigestible uh, bits of uh, soil that uh, are not nutritious. Uh, those fecal pellets are actually coated um, in organic slime from the earthworm um, itself. Uh, and the, the burrow lining is also covered in slime. Now, earthworms are just cruising through the soil all the time. Uh, so uh, the inflated one, which is from the recent passing of the earthworm, because it moves by peristaltic motion, they always, the burrows will have a, um, a definite diameter, which reflects the diameter of the expanded organism pushing its way um, through uh, the soil. But um, other earthworms beside it um, will um, collapse that burrow. It will also collapse under its own weight because it's largely um, open air. Um, and the fecal pellets will be littered in this kind of collapsed burrow with an altered margin to it. Um, I have actually found uh, examples of this kind of behavior all the way back to the Triassic in paleosols, in thin sections of paleosols. Pretty remarkable. Um, actually, Triassic is not so remarkable. I, I would have expected earthworms to be go back to the Devonian. Um, and it's a puzzle to me that we haven't found them in rocks of Devonian age because um, earthworms do like forests. Um, they're especially like grasslands. Um, I would have expected them to have a rather longer record that would match pretty much um, the record of um, individual um, uh, forests, which goes back uh, to the Devonian, as we'll, as we'll see. Uh, dung beetles.
I've actually made headlines in newspapers with my research on dung beetles in fossil soils. Um, dung beetles leave really remarkable traces um, in, uh, in soil. Um, what happens um, after a large ungulate, an elephant or a wildebeest poops? There's this steaming pile of poop. Uh, and then um, the beetle, uh, which has, they have very strong forearms. And it's largely the female that does this work. Um, and then they have, of course, the divided uh, elytron, which is the wing covers, uh, and then um, uh, six limbs, like all um, insects, will burrow through this material and start to make a burrow system. I actually discovered one like this um, in rocks of Oligocene age in South Dakota and was able to describe it. Um, believe it or not, uh, dung beetles uh, have a tremendous am amount of competition for this resource. Some of them will just exploit the dung um, at the surface. They eat it, um, and then uh, they just lay their eggs in it, and then the larvae will hatch uh, at the surface. Um, this one here, which is Onthophagus, a common dung beetle of uh, forests in um, in Germany um, and the eastern uh, United States, um, actually uh, makes a complicated burrow system. It uh, actually lays an egg out here, and then it packs the hollow um, with dung. It lays another egg, and then packs the hollow with dung. It lays another egg, packs the hollow with dung. It lays another egg, packs the hollow with dung. Uh, and then just backfills scratching away at the sediment, so that these are now buried um, uh, tens of centimeters below the surface of the soil um, itself. This makes a very distinctive kind of a trace fossil. What happens next, of course, the egg hatches. It hatches into a kind of a hunched back kind of a larva, or caterpillar stage. Um, that caterpillar exhausts that um, dung uh, food. Uh, in Onthophagus, these are about uh, one centimeter or so uh, in diameter. Uh, then it goes into a chrysalis form, that is the dormant form. You may have seen chrysalises of butterflies. This is the caterpillar um, or larval form. Uh, there's a chrysalis. Uh, and then next spring, uh, when conditions are right and um, fresh dung is being deposited all over the landscape again, they emerge as adult um, beetles. Uh, they metamorphose. Uh, into adult uh, beetles. Uh, this is a very elaborate kind of a um, behavior that we find in Onthophagus. Um, and um, this is a, uh, a kind of a trace fossil which is quite uh, distinctive. Some South American um, dung beetles uh, form a, um, put a clay coat around the dung. So they, they laid the egg up in here. Here's the dung. Here's the clay, uh, the clay coat. Uh, this trace fossil is called polychnus. And this trace fossil with the clay coat is called, um, not celliforma, um, copper and sphera. Uh, Coprinus vera, that's an eye there too, um, is um, best known from Argentina. Uh, and uh, these are quite elaborate structures that the dung beetles make in order to keep competition away from this resource and away from their larvae, which are developing um, underground. Coprinus vera is not generally not as deeply buried as, um, as, as Polychnus, um, which is a rather simpler structure. Uh, there's a, been a competition. Uh, through time of um, different kinds of uh, dung sequestering and different kinds of dung larval forms. And these are quite complicated structures uh, that demonstrate an evolutionary increase in social behavior. Um, these beetles are uh, what we call sub-social. Um, in some species, the male and the female do cooperate 
in making this elaborate uh, species. Um, the female, of course, uh, has most of the work. Um, and um, the more elaborate structures are the structures that are found in the um, social species rather than the sub-social species. Uh, bees. Uh, bees also nest in the ground. Uh, bees have a rather different kind of a, um, a nesting structure, which consists of these ovate structures, which branch off a series of chambers. And it's a very similar kind of effect. Um, this is the underground nest of a bee called Alga chlora, otherwise known as a sweat bee. Uh, and it's a complicated kind of construction uh, which has chambers and often also aerating structures uh, around it. What happens is the, uh, the, the, the these bees are social bees. So they have a worker class and then they have a queen. Uh, the queen is a part of the hive system. Uh, the queen, um, the, the workers gather pollen and nectar and they deposit the pollen and nectar in the individual chambers and then the queen lays an egg in each one. Same sort of deal as the dung beetles, uh, nectar and pollen. Now, honeybees do the same thing, of course, except they don't nest in the ground. Uh, they produce a honeycomb. Um, and we do have fossils of those in cave deposits and other um, areas. Uh, but these kinds of complicated nests, uh, and then it's backfilled, of course, to protect the developing larvae. Uh, same story, um, the, um, the queen bee um, Uh, we'll uh, put an egg in each of these chambers, which is constructed and provisioned by the drones and the workers of the colony. Uh, and then the um, egg will hatch. The egg will hatch into a pupil stage, like a, you've probably seen a uh, little bee larvae. Uh, then it will um, pupate and become a pupa or chrysalis. Uh, and then eventually it will hatch as an adult bee to drone on. Uh, through the next uh, the next season, very similar uh, story. Now, there's a whole different variety of social behavior in bees as well. These are eusocial. They have a queen, they have drones, and they have workers. Uh, this is a complicated structure, and it takes an organized bee society to do something uh, like that. Um, in uh, a simpler case, um, like um, Helictus, which is a sweat bee. Um, the, um, there's just a simple hole in the ground and it has a, a, a spiral closure. They make a clay coat uh, that has a sort of a spiral top to it. They deposit the nectar down in here with an egg um, and it's just a simple kind of a structure in the soil. Um, these are solitary bees. This is what one female can do um, on her own. Um, these kinds of trace fossils, if we find them in a paleosol, it's called celliforma. Um, this kind of trace fossil, if we find it in um, a paleosol, is called Uruguay. Ignis. And we have um, these different degrees of um, insect sociality, which we can see in successive paleosols. These go back all the way to the Eocene or so. Um, bees actually go back into the uh, Cretaceous, and there are a few Cretaceous examples of these, but not too convincing. The really full-on ones with the spiral closures and everything are only known back to the Eocene. Then we get progressively more complicated ones through time. Uruguay Agnes is known, for example, in the Miocene and in the Pliocene. Um, and then we don't really have honeycomb until we get to the Pleistocene. So what we're looking at in the um, sequence of these kinds of animal burrows is an evolution of bee sociality through time. Fascinating. 
um, the work of bees is really uh, quite uh, quite remarkable. Um, perhaps the most important um, insects for uh, soil sowing are uh, termites and ants. And they have very uh, distinctive uh, kinds of uh, nests indeed. Uh, for example, uh, in um, tropical regions of um, Africa and Australia, there are these wonderful uh, nests of termites that are three meters tall. That's taller than you. Um, they, uh, and in a cross section, they're quite elaborate constructions that are made through mass by massive colonies of uh, social um, termites. Um, there is a, a, a solid exterior. Um, then there's a kind of a porous layer. Um, and um, inside here, there's a whole bunch of uh, chambers and galleries. Um, some of these, this is, this is the egg chamber, that's where the queen termite is. Um, these are brood and fungus gardens. Uh, this is macrotermies. A very common termite um, in um, tropical Africa and Western Australia. Um, the uh, queen is in the egg chamber. She's just pumping out eggs. Um, the fungus gardens are from the work of the workers um, in gathering sticks and stones and depositing them as a substrate for the growth of fungus, which forms a food uh, for uh, the termite. Now, these termite nests are commonly in relatively arid areas. There's not a lot of food around, um, and hot areas, uh, which are uh, quite um, oppressive. But the nest itself is constructed in such a way that it's actually air conditioning, and uh, the drones and workers can actually beat their wings and create a current through this system which creates a natural air conditioning. The pH of um, the termite nest with these fungal nests and the organic matter is quite a bit higher than the pH of the surrounding soil. And so um, the nest is often quite calcareous. So we get these calcareous nodules that have these wormy appearance from the various galleries um, of, the, of the workers supplying the fungus uh, nests. Um, this is a trace fossil called termitechnus. Um, and it's quite common um, in the fossil record, going well back into Eocene uh, time. And also a very good indicator of uh, climate conditions. I've talked about this before. The spherical micropeds of termites, these are all built up of fecal pellets and oral pellets that are fashioned this brick by brick on a tiny scale, like millimeter by millimeter, by individual uh, termites. Quite remarkable structures. These are termite mansions or termite uh, cities. Ants. Uh, will have a, a kind of a nest structure, which is really weird, um, in which there are vertical galleries. Uh, there's often um, uh, a rejected pile of stones at the top. Um, these are um, ant nests, uh, for example, uh, Pogona myrmex. Uh, vertebrate paleontologists love these, uh, these particular ant nests because if there are fossil teeth, tiny teeth down in here, the ants will reject them and put them preferentially on top. So we, we go for the ant nests. Um, this is a very distinctive structure in which the galleries, which are the nesting galleries and the queen um, galleries, are uh, sort of horizontal caverns, um, and they're connected by vertical um, uh, passages. This is Atta Ichnus. Uh, the ants are basically just dragging back any kind of food that they can. 
um, into this burrow system to feed uh, the queen and to generate um, lots and lots of, um, of new uh, of new progeny. So um, we have a um, a whole bunch of trace fossils. Oh, these these also reveal, of course, the evolution of sociality in ants. Um, the earliest ant nests are relatively simple. This is a fairly advanced one that you start seeing in around about the late Oligocene, early Miocene. Um, we can look at the development of social behavior and um, the evolution of behavioral uh, complexity from evidence um, like this. So that's um, a guide to some of the really interesting things we can tell um, about um, individual um, kinds of creatures in uh, paleosols. What about the trace fossils of ecosystems kind of um, a view? Um, well, um, it turns out that the whole profile is a really good guide uh, to um, individual kinds of um, ecosystems. Under woodland, um, in the modern world, what we generally find uh, is a profile uh, that will have a, an A horizon, an E horizon, a BT horizon, and a C. And that's because the roots of the trees are relatively long and extend uh, down into the soil. They taper uh, quite strongly and um, those roots enable uh, clay uh, to be washed down into the profile. Uh, they are responsible for this BT horizon. Um, pretty much wherever there's a forest um, that has developed for a considerable length of time, several thousand years, there will be a BT horizon. Interestingly, as we go back in time, as we'll see in the last part of this course, um, these BT horizons first turn up in the Devonian, and they turn up around about the same time as the earliest uh, as the earliest trees, the earliest trees with their tapering boles and their um, tapering roots down into uh, the soil. In contrast, uh, in a grassland, um, we have just grasses generally. Uh, we have a, an A horizon, which is mollic. Uh, we have a B K horizon, uh, which is calcareous. And then we have a C horizon. Um, this uh, soil profile structure uh, characterizes a grassland because the fine root traces of grasses do not generally form a BT horizon. They form a thick A horizon, which is very rich in organic matter and the fecal pellets of earthworms that are churning it. Um, it is not such a deeply weathering regime. Grasslands of the world are generally in rather uh, drier uh, climates, and so there's often carbonate at the depth at which the level of carbon dioxide in the soil from soil respiration starts to attenuate. Then the carbonate comes out as uh, a nodules with a depth that is proportional to the productivity of the ecosystem and the mean annual um, rainfall. Uh, we can also get, of course, a, a continuum. Uh, we can get wooded grassland. This, of course, is forest or, um, or woodland. Um, and in this situation, we're going to get a little bit of both. We're going to get an A horizon, which is quite organic rich. We're not going to get too much of a, um, make it a bit of a BT horizon. We might get a bit of a calcic horizon. Um, there will be big root traces occasionally from the trees, and there'll be lots of fine root traces uh, from um, the grasses um, themselves. Now, these are, of course, in a continuum in, in Africa and also in um, the US. Um, we can see um, pretty clearly that these grade one into another. Uh, this would be the Okekui forests of um, 
Illinois and Indiana, uh, as there were before settlement, of course. There's a lot of um, man-made um, grasslands there from uh, the cutting of the forests, and uh, that, of course, fueled the industrial growth of Chicago and other Midwestern cities and turning them into agricultural grasslands. Um, and they grayed out by the time you get into Iowa into a vegetation which the native vegetation would have looked like this. Uh, this is widespread in Africa too. You get the, the forest and the woodland by the streams. You get this um, in the plains. And then in the really open plains uh, further from streams. Uh, and then in drier climates, now we're talking about Kansas, uh, going on into Colorado. Not too many trees left and it's just a big open uh, grassland with great herds of, of buffalo um, and uh, wildebeest. Soil profile form is, and soil profile structures, particularly root structures, are a pretty good guide uh, to um, different kinds of plant um, communities. Um, this has been my bread and butter for quite some uh, some time. Uh, it's this continuum, of course, which is most important, we think, for the evolution of humans in Africa. For many years, I was funded to work on paleosols associated with early human fossils in Africa. Uh, and the idea was to see, are the fossil humans found in this kind of soil, this kind of soil, or this kind of soil? Uh, and particularly, I was interested in the early ape predecessors of the early humans. Um, and the humans were out in both of these all right, but the apes were entirely here. So that uh, I'll return to this theme um, and talk about human evolution from the perspective of fossil soils uh, near the end of this near the end of this course. Let me move on now and talk about um, wetland soils. Now these kinds of soils that we're talking about with um, calcareous uh, nodules and with red BT horizons, um, those are the sorts of paleosols you're going to find in calcareous um, red bed land sequences. But of course, we have a lot of different kinds of soils um, in uh, coal measure sequences. Um, coal measures give us a tremendous fossil record, um, not only of fossil plants, because the, the plants are making up the coal, and you can see the coal um, under a microscope, and we'll do this in a future lab, you can see the individual plant fragments of coal much altered by heat and pressure. Uh, but there are also plants that are preserved in the shales and sandstones around um, the coal seams. Uh, so we have um, several uh, sorts of uh, plant communities. Uh, the classic ones that we see reconstructions of for the Pennsylvanian, and uh, we know about these, uh, of course, from um, modern uh, wetlands, uh, is, the, is a swamp ecosystem. In a swamp um, ecosystem, um, what we have are trees that are growing on peat. And uh, they are making a very thick peaty deposit. Uh, this is an O horizon or a histic epipedon. There's an A horizon which has root traces. A critical feature of the soil of this nature is that the root traces are tabular. And they often include uh, aquatic adaptations like chambered roots, like we saw in the root um, uh, section of the lab exercises. Uh, there can be nodules here. These are a BG horizon and generally they are of siderite or pyrite. That's FeCO3 or FeS, iron uh, sulfide. These are the sorts of minerals that form under um, the very reducing, chemically reducing conditions of a uh, swamp uh, soil. The water table is generally pretty high. Um, sometimes it's all the way up here. Sometimes it's down about here. Um, and the whole thing is forming as the area subsides. So these form in wetland environments. 
uh, that are in coastal regions or in big mountain valleys that are subsiding slowly enough that the plant can get enough air to its roots to continue to grow and provide organic matter to make the peat uh, and um, not get not 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 die out. Um, these are not super important soils in the modern in environment. They're um, they're um, quite important, of course, for carbon sequestration. Um, but these soils constitute about one or two percent of the world's land area. But in the rock record. Um, these are super important because they are a source of a lot of our fuel, uh, coal for generating electricity, and have been studied for a long, long uh, time. Um, we know a lot about um, these kinds of um, environments. Um, also, um, in these environments, we have a um, herbaceous equivalent. Same kind of profile, O, A, B, G, but it's just grasses. Um, this is technically what we call a marsh, not a swamp, a marsh. Um, these two alternatives can be actually pretty hard to tease apart in the fossil uh, record. Um, sometimes um, you have to go uh, to uh, the actual peat itself, uh, which is turned into coal, of course, with burial compaction, and look at the nature of material in the coal itself. Um, in a swamp system, we'll have these um, bright, um, compacted uh, masserals called fusonite. We can see actually bits of um, the original plants that were in the soil, forming the soil. Fusionite is actually fossil charcoal. So you can look for charcoal in the paleosol. Uh, and if there's charcoal, that means there were fires. Yes, there are fires in swamps. There are, there are fires in the Florida um, Everglades um, as well. Um, and uh, these uh, uh, fires produce charcoal, which is introduced and is unmistakable when you have a thin section of a peat or a coal. Um, and there are other traces of uh, plant material that you can, you can look at as well. A swamp is different from a marsh. There's a particular kind of a, a marsh that we find um, in a um, uh, in a, uh, in a in a coastal environment. And it's called a salt marsh. Um, salt marsh can have quite a thick peat to it as well. Um, there, there, there are fine root traces. There's an A, an O, a BG. In this case, the, um, the subsurface material and also the material in the peat itself is pyrite. And that's because um, there's a lot of sulfate in seawater. These salt marshes grow uh, within the intertidal zone. So um, high tide is here, low tide is here. Uh, and uh, because the sea has quite a bit of sulfate in it, that sulfate is reduced, chemically reduced, by sulfate reducing bacteria to form pyrite in the soil. Very distinctive when you get pyrite in a coal or a peat that is probably a salt marsh. Unless, of course, um, it is a, um, a mangrove. Um, in many tropical regions of the world, uh, such as the Florida Everglades, um, we get these intertidal trees. There's high tide, there's low tide. This is called a mangal. The individual trees are called mangrove. Um, and it'll form the same sort of soil. An O horizon, an A horizon, a BG horizon. And that BG horizon will include pyrite for the same, uh, for the same reason. Um, these mangrove or mangal soils 
Uh, so this is uh, Mangal. Are only found in tropical regions. I'm not quite sure why. Um, there's something about um, the warmth of the tropics which allows trees to grow in this very difficult environment with a lot of osmotic stress from salt water um, to the plant itself. They have to adapt to that salt water. Um, the mangrove forests are diverse and 20, 30 meters tall in Indonesia. Um, but as you go north and south, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that in uh, Haining, in, in China, and also in Sydney Harbour, uh, the mangrove trees are only about a half meter tall. And then north and south of there, um, in Oregon and in uh, the southern parts of Australia, we have uh, salt marsh. Uh, similar sort of soil profile. This one, of course, has trees in it. That means there are going to be a few big root traces in here. Um, there'll be fusonite and other evidence of trees in here. And also, there will be oysters or other creatures that live on the tree trunks. Here's the tree trunk here. The oysters actually grow on the trees. Other kinds of uh, marine invertebrates will grow in this kind of a setting and are often preserved in these uh, mangal uh, soils. Now, these two kinds of wetlands are um, acidic, but there's um, another uh, kind of uh, wetland which is alkaline and also has uh, quite a good uh, fossil record. Um, this kind of um, marshy vegetation is not actually a marsh, it's a fen. Uh, fen is uh, described as an alkaline wetland. That means the pH is greater than 7. Uh, it forms a very similar kind of uh, soil. So you have an O, you have an A with fine root traces, you have a BG, But that BG sometimes includes limestone and dolomite. C, A, C, O, 3, and dolomite. Limestone, this mineral is of course calcite, which forms a limestone. Uh, dolomite is a mineral. M, G, C, A, C, O, 3, two times. Um, the alkaline conditions of a fen give you a kind of a unique kind of a paleosol uh, which has a histic epipedon, uh, which has a clay A horizon, uh, and then has uh, free carbonate in um, the subsurface. Um, and then there's another alternative, which is called car, uh, in which you have a uh, a kind of a forest um, in a wetland, which has an O, um, an A, it's a forest, so it'll have big root traces and fusonite, other indications of trees, there'll be an A, uh, and um, carbonate. This is actually a B, a BK. Or a BG. Um, these are um, indications of alkaline conditions as well. Um, these kinds of soils are quite rare today. I actually had a paper just recently on one uh, from uh, South Australia, uh, which is an alkaline wetland. A reason it's they're rare is because trees are acidifying, vegetation is acidifying, generally speaking. Um, it, um, it rains down uh, phenols and other materials into the soil profile. Uh, it also creates a high soil uh, carbon dioxide uh, level, um, which uh, generates carbonic acid as well. So they tend to be acidic. Uh, and it takes a special condition, like a strong dry season, or a lot of limestone bedrock, or something like that, uh, to enable um, this uh, precipitation of calcite or dolomite um, in the profile um, itself. Um, however, in the past, that does not seem to have been such a strict um, condition. Um, these nodules here 
are what we call coal balls. Uh, in the Pennsylvanian and in uh, the Permian especially, um, vegetation was not quite as acidifying as it is now. Uh, and many of these PD ecosystems were car, those are the woody ones, and fen, those are the herbaceous ones. Uh, they weren't grasses back then. Uh, they were herbaceous um, leucopsids. Uh, these were the tree leucopsids and tree ferns and other things. Um, but these cobalts formed in the soil profile, in a reducing subsurface environment, and often preserved the plant material perfectly. It's a reducing environment. That means fungi and other decomposing animals can't get down there. This plant material is not too compacted. It's just dropped into the mud uh, and is um, uh, it's, it's lost a lot of its organic matter for the cell contents, for example. But the cell walls are still good. Uh, and the precipitation of calcite in those um, cell spaces uh, is what uh, creates uh, the coal ball. So we can actually tell quite a bit um, about different communities uh, from their uh, paleosols. And uh, I see my phone is ringing, and that's probably enough for uh, today.